So yeah, it's quite nice to be here uh, 20, 20 years later. I mean, I did come back once, I think in the meantime. Um, and uh, yeah, the title of my, yeah. And then just uh, if, uh, if you want to contact me, if we, you have any questions or whatever, feel free. Actually in Twitter, I should have removed because I've moved to Mastodon. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I still have the account, but the email is, uh, is safer. Um, so the title of my talk is, is it somebody else's problem to correct errors or worse uh, in design to crew cause? And, um, you know, we, 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 we always say that uh, science is self-correcting. Um, that's something that I'm sure you've all heard. But what does that actually mean in practice? You know, who is, who is doing the self-correction of science? And, um, why having done my phd and my studies in physics and my phd in uh, in um, physical chemistry and you know why why did i end up asking these kind of questions is kind of the, the story stops here for me i'm trying to move maybe this far. Well, anyway. so this is a this is a paper published in 2004 Spontaneous assembly of sub nanometer ordered domains in the ligand shell of monolayer protected nanoparticles. It was published in Nature Materials in 2004. And I think a number of you have experience with scanning for microscopy, not least of all, <laughs> of course, Munir. Um, and so maybe you, you see a problem with this image. So it's supposed to show the organization of ligands at the surface of nanoparticles. And uh, I don't know if anyone wants to make a comment or yes. So there's also an organization along the axis of the image. Yeah, right? so, so all the stripes are in the same direction, which happens to be perpendicular to the scanning direction. So it's a, it suggests that this is a, a scanning probe microscopy artifact. Um, so there is the fact that the direction is, is perpendicular to the scanning. And then also, if it was random, you would expect that each particle would sort of be in different directions. So why would it be like this? And so what did I do then? So in 2004, uh, so that was two years after my PhD. Um, so I recognized this problem. I was interested more generally in, uh, in the organization of ligands. Uh, I wasn't working this kind of, on this kind of ligands, but uh, I was working with peptides at the time. But I was quite interested in this idea that ligands at the surface of particles could be organizing, could be maybe forming patches, or so the topic was of interest. But you know, I was a, I was a postdoc and I had other priorities. I, I, you know, I looked at this paper, but then basically, um, I didn't do anything. Um, as a postdoc, I didn't do anything. But then, 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 you know, years went on and uh, there was a, this didn't stop with this paper. There were a lot of other papers. Uh, one of those was in 2008 where th the message of that paper was that because of this structure, these particles had the special ability to penetrate cells and uh, get to the cytosol. So inside the, inside the cell and diffused everywhere inside the cell. And um, at that point I was, um, I was uh, very interested, even more interested in this topic also of, uh, I had moved to a biology laboratory. I, have, I was starting my, my, my own research group and I was very interested in getting particles in cells. Um, so I submitted a paper um, in 2009, which was called Striping Nanoparticles Revisited and which uh, was reanalyzing some of these pictures. And also we had done some experiments on the, the entry of particles into cells. So it was submitted in 2009 and um, it was eventually published in small. Anyone wants to guess in which year it was published? <laughs> so it was published in 2012. So it uh, took three years to be published. It's a common mystery yep. of the title of the journal, so small to slow. <laughs> yeah. So the other way around. Yes, yeah, yes. So it, it was, it took two years. So. I mean, a lot of things happened during these two years. This could be a, a talk in itself. Um, and a lot of things 
happened afterwards once this paper was published. So this was my kind of first, let's say, adventure in correction of science uh, or in raising, you know, problematic papers. Um, and uh, you know, but let's say just to to explain a little bit maybe why it took so long. I mean, uh, the the editor obviously was very. Um, conscious that this was controversial. He wanted to protect himself and his journal. He requested a lot of different uh, reports, which uh, never came because you, nobody wanted to touch it. Um, eventually, my paper or our paper took 18 months to be accepted. But then the response also took 18 months to be reviewed and accepted. And we only published them back to back. So that's why at the end, it took three years before publishing. Um, when finally it was out, I started to use some other means of communication to try to accelerate science dis scientific discussion because you know I don't think it's reasonable to wait for three years to start the scientific discussion. So that includes a blog and also uh, other social media. I've mentioned Twitter. And yeah, as I said, many things happen. And one of the things that happened is that um, I was contacted once the story was out by this young, young scientist who had been asked to do, he was in the group uh, that has published all these uh, stripe in nanoparticles papers. And he had been asked already in 2004, so just after the publication of the first paper to do similar things with another type of particles. And he was a bright student. So the first thing he did is a few controls. He observed that you could get the same kind of pattern without any particle on the surface. He even, um, uh, did some uh, uh, computer simulation with a model to understand how these kind of patterns emerge from the feedback mechanisms of the scanning probe microscope. He went to see his supervisor, and then basically his supervisor told him that he was mad, that he forbid him to talk to any group members, and then the whole thing um, became uh, basically a conflict within the institution. There was an investigation within this is at MIT Department of uh, Materials Engineering. And, um, and, and then nothing of that came out. So the problem that I raised in 2009 that eventually became public in 2012, seven years before they had been identified by this student, and eventually the, the response of the institution or the institutions even of science meant that nothing became public. The problems just basically grew further uh, for several years. So, you know, self-correction of science in this case uh, maybe didn't work that well. Um, so because of, I think, not so much because of stripe nanoparticles, because uh, stripe nanoparticles is, you know, is a very niche to topic and um, nobody is really so fascinated. But because of the way the controversy uh, kind of expanded on social media, which at the time, you know, it wasn't the first one, but it was a little bit new, including in this field. This story attracted a bit of attention in various uh, sort of media, more kind of specialized or blogs. And um, uh, eventually, uh, I think this one is, I always come to this one, but maybe I'll mention it again when we, to more towards the end. So. You know, in the stripy controversy, did science self-correct? I really don't know. Like, I'd be interested to hear what you know what people think. In some ways, there has been some self-correction. Like, if you look into the scientific literature and you look at papers, there are, there are still stripy papers which have been published. You know, following our initial paper, quite a few of them actually. Um, but at least you can find counter arguments and the story has been discussed in various places. So if you are a student working in this field, probably you've heard of, of this, you know, of the controversy and you're not going to start a project on this without knowing if that these problems exist. So in some ways, yes, and in other ways, not really. So now I want to talk about another one. I think I'll talk probably about three different <laughs> controversies today and also uh, about an ongoing project. Um, feel free to interrupt, ask questions uh, anytime. So maybe before I move to the next one, I don't know if there is any any question or comments on the, on the stripes. This is a really good question, really really good question. And uh, um, 
So he was silenced and the counter by, by MIT and the counterpart was he was kind of moved into another team, but eventually he never actually completed his PhD. And um, I, um, I'm i not quite sure exactly what he's doing now, I think. I'm not really, let's put it this way, I'm not really worried about him because I think he's a very bright person and I'm sure he's, you know, he made something of his life. But um, as very often in these stories, um, you know, you've got people who get disgusted by the system and who leave science. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't really mention that, I think, in these few words, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that would be also. <laughs> so, uh, so what happened is initially I submitted this revisited paper to Nature Materials uh, because that's where the first paper was published um, and also this second paper, I mean, the two I mentioned here in total. By the time we published Stripe Revisited, there were more than 10 papers and now it's more than 20 probably. Um, so yeah, we first submitted there. They took a few months to tell us that we should reformat it, um, you know, as a technical comment instead of an opinion. Or I don't know. I don't remember the details, but basically asking us to change the number of words or whatever. And then we resubmitted, and then they sent it to a few of um, of the author's mates, and um, we had some some really quite surreal comments. Um, and yeah, it was rejected. Um, and then, yeah, then we, we submitted to small, um, yeah, yeah, then it took a very long time to be published, but, um, and you can have that experience of the people, not saying that the most working journal of all of these days that Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I can say a lot of things about the publishing system. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure I agree with this uh, description of, you know, on one side, society journal, the good guys, and on the other side, the commercial journals, the bad guys. And I've had some difficult experiences with some other journals as well. Um, um, but you know, surely the the evaluation system based on the ranking of the journals is one of the drivers of this kind of thing, right? People are, are, are pushing very hard because they want to get published in these uh, glossy journals, and they can take some shortcuts, and uh, and so there are there are, there are there are big issues there. Um, um, but yeah, the the the. The, the the interface between the institutions, though, so in this case MIT, uh, the journals, um, the relationship between editors and the and the big authors that they want to attract to publish in their journals, that there, there are a few unhealthy relationships. But uh, I think in um, um, in society journals, like if you take uh, in the in the second example that I'm going to start in a few seconds. You know, the main author is a very big guy in the US. Um, and um, and uh, he has links in the ACS at all levels. And uh, I, I'm not sure it's healthier than, <laughs> in a way, I mean, I was actually talking yesterday uh, because I'm in Strasbourg for the, the meeting of the French Society of, uh, Nanomedic of the Nanomedicine. And um, there, there is a, 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 nature na a Nature Nano editor there, and I was uh, discussing with him, and, um, and he was actually making the opposite point from you, saying, uh, you know, we are not, we don't have any direct relationship with authors. We, we're not their colleagues, so we are completely independent. And, you know, if there are problems, we would ask. So, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> I, I'm, I, yeah, okay, let's, let's stop here start the second controversy. So for the second controversy, I just need to introduce a tiny bit of science, which is all science because already in the 1960s, it was known that when a, a nanoparticle or a colloid, as it would have been called at the time, enter into cells, they enter by endocytosis. And 
and the cytosis means that the particle will enter the cell, but it will end up in a compartment inside the cell, which is this endosome, and so it can't just diffuse everywhere inside the cell. And um, um, so this is this is quite important. In fact, um, it's it's even the case that nanoparticles were used as contrast agents to study this phenomenon. So it was uh, so gold particles are very good um, electron microscopy contrast agents, and you know this was how uh, it was done. So then um, I start this story with this paper in um, in uh, in science in science sorry. 2006, with these particles which are covered with oligonucleotides. And um, they're supposed to enter cells and um, interact with, uh, with RNA and basically uh, uh, modify uh, intracellular gene regulation. And this is great, but this can only work if at least some of the particles escape endosomes. And maybe that happens, you know, why not? But um, you would expect at least that this would be discussed somewhere in the paper. But if you search for endocytosis or actually any description whatsoever of the mechanism of uptake and of how those particles access their targets inside the cell, um, there is nothing. So this is, this is I think it's quite uh, extraordinary, I mean, um, because it's like if you describe, um, I don't know, uh, uh, how to build a plane and you say nothing about the motor or something like this. I mean, again, we're talking about science being reproducible and so on. And here there is a big step that where like it's complete mystery, it's kind of magic, right? So does it continue? How does this story continue? So yeah, no much is found for the cytosis. What happens next? A lot of promises. Many more publications that still fail to answer a basic question about the technology, companies, millions of dollars of public and private funds, commercialization, clinical trials, uh, lots of prizes. So I'm going to run through some of these to just explain what I mean. <clears throat> I'm sorry if my voice is shaking a little bit. I'm actually cold. I jumped a little bit. So um, these are some of the promises. So um, opens the door for new possibilities in the study of gene function, you know, new avenues for tackling glioblastoma, Alzheimer, Parkinson, both spectrum, she got everything, you know, could positively impact tens of millions of people. And then, um, <laughs> thank you so much. Are you going to be no, cool? I'm, I'm <laughs> right, wow. Okay. It's even provided already warmed up with this. Uh, uh, we want uh, so. <laughs> So um, um, yeah, okay. So this is this is a quite extraordinary uh, quotes, okay, which come from either papers or for the one that with all the colors. It comes from an interview in a national radio in the U.S. Um, and um, and one interesting point um, in this is that the you know, in terms of reproducing uh, work from, from other laboratories, in, especially in this field of uh, nanoparticles and so on, one difficulty is always going to be, um, you know, if you try and you can't make it, it's probably because you're not a good enough chemist, right? You, you haven't managed to, to, to make these very special particles and so on. So here, the fact that the technology was commercialized meant that, and also that I was based in an environment where in biology, a, a biology, uh, a biological sciences laboratory where there are biologists who want to detect mRNA. Okay, this technology, there is one that is interfering with mRNA and another which is supposed to detect mRNA, like it's the same here, detecting mRNA in living cells. So this is something that biologists, if you know, if you can do that, they would be very interested. So we decided to 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 buy, um, but I come back to that later and just. Um, so, you know, this is some of the money involved. And one of the companies called AuraSense, you know, Bill Gates. Um, okay, this is just pocket money for him, but uh, um, this is this becomes a little bit more than pocket money, but this is not real money, actually. This is like, uh, it's up to 790 million. At the end, I'm not sure how much they put in. Um, and, you know, some of it is also 
is also a public money kind of grant to companies and to laboratories and so on. So we're talking about a lot of money. We're talking about lots of prizes as well for these technologies. And so what happens if you buy this, these particles to detect mRNA and you, you, you try to, to look at what happens? Well, you find them in these compartments I was talking about, these endosomes. And that's not where mRNA is. So then that, that means they can't really detect mRNA. And this is also what we conclude. And I didn't want to spend three years trying to publish this. So we just published it on a, as what we, as kind of a sort of preprint. So it went immediately online and then there was, a, it was kind of a, yes. Um, I said, um, this is the main use, um, but this is Well, I mean, if you if you block everything, maybe the cells end up being not so well. And so, but you know, the idea here. So uh, maybe one thing I should add, and then you know, is that um, probably many of you have had the mRNA vaccine, mRNA-based vaccine. And this technology works beautifully, right? And it means that some of these particles, which are lipid uh, mRNA, lip, lipid nanoparticles containing mRNA, um, enter the cell and can access the cell machinery. If, if they were stuck in endosome indefinitely, then the, the vaccine would not work. Similarly, if, you, if some of you are biologists or collaborate with biologists, you've heard of transfection. Transfection is working because some genetic material escapes endosomes. So I'm not saying that nothing ever gets out of endosome. You know, a small proportion will, especially if the system has been well designed and so on. But when we're talking about a small proportion, we're talking about 1%, maybe even less than 1%, which is enough to have a biological effect. If you could improve it, then it would be great. And it's a one big avenue of research. But for for a technology like the smart flare, where the, the particle is actually your contrast agent. This is what you're trying to use to see your mRNA. If 99% of that is in endosome, any signal that you will measure will be mostly due to what's in endosome and not to the very small proportion which might have escaped. Now, coming back to your question, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's possible that a very small fraction uses some other routes. I think probably everything enters by some form of endocytosis, and then there is a small fraction that can escape in some cases. But um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, in this application, the one percent is not enough. In some other application, we care a lot because this one percent is doing the work and and it's useful. But also, <laughs> it's, it's harder. Yeah, but it's also easier to visualize, which is quite useful. Any other question? No? So this was our work. Uh, this is a, an email, again, when things become public, you get strange emails, interactions, and so on. So this is Luke Armstrong. He was working for the company that was commercially commercializing this technology. He spent eight months doing application development, and he found zero evidence that it recognized the time of mRNA. And in spite of that, and in spite of him saying that to his bosses and so on in companies, the, they continued to sell these products to biology labs across the world. And for me, this was quite amazing because, again, very naively, I thought that, you know, this kind of thing that can happen in, in universities where we just publish things and, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, who cares? We've published a paper, we are happy. Um, I, I thought, you know, this shouldn't work in companies. They are trying to sell a product. So if it doesn't work, surely they... But in fact, it's not like that. You know, in companies as well, people make their careers based on, on a, a product that they've championed and so on. And so yeah, well, his boss probably had a very big interest in, in this story continuing, and he didn't want to hear what he had to say. This slide, you mean, or the... I mean, people always publish something that is happening, but something that is not happening, nobody is publishing. Yes, right? so uh, 
So this is the problem of um, publishing bias. That's how it's uh, described in the literature. And uh, yeah, we're not publishing or not publishing enough negative results. Therefore, you know, in this story of the smart fairs, you probably have hundreds of labs across the world, which, which um, they, they, they bought this stuff, they did some experiments. It was quite expensive as well. And then it goes into the file drawer. It doesn't work. Who cares? You put it in the file drawer and then it continues. What is it supposed to do? To activate the gene or, or to? No, it's um, so yeah, I haven't explained how it works, but um, it's uh, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's basically uh, you have the you have the gold particle and then you have uh, your DNA and you have a an MRI strand, uh, or another oligonucleotide with a fluor pore, which is quenched. And the one that you want to detect is going to uh, is going to hybridize to this one, and this one will be released and therefore unquenched. So you will have an increase in fluorescence, and it will detect the mRNA. Of course, it means direct contact between this and the mRNA you want to target. And also, the big problem is that in endosomes, of course, this is part of the defense mechanism of the cell. So it's rich in virus enzymes that would degrade whatever comes in, including oligonucleotide, so you have nucleases in these. If, if this gets cut by a nuclease, then you also get an increase in fluorescence. And so basically the, the fluorescent signal is, is dominated by the, by the nucleases. Yes, or, or, or the plasmonic uh, resonant mode of gold uh, picks up the, the nucleotide and it dissociates. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the kind of, uh, of uh, power you use for fluorescence, we probably wouldn't generally heat up too much, but yeah, that, that can also, in principle, be an effect. Um, so yeah, it, it's this, you know, correcting science wasn't really uh, Luke's job, so you know, he basically tried to do his bit by talking to his bosses, but that wasn't enough. So we published a paper, and then this was a paper published by two Polish scientists, um, and uh, the title is very un unambiguous, smart fair failing to reflect their target transcript level. And this was published in, um, in scientific reports and um, it's very complementary to our study because um, they had some really nice biology tools with some nice controls um, and basically confirmed our results. Uh, so, okay, I'm gonna, you know, they, they thought it was important to correct the transcript record. Their aim at the beginning was to use this technology. Eventually, it was discontinued. So that brings us to a um, uh, national meeting of the American Chemical Society, where uh, uh, in Boston, where uh, Chad Merkin, so the author of all of these papers and um, founders of all these startups and so on, was presenting and uh, I, I I was there, I listened to his talk and then I asked this question or tried to ask this question. I mean, it's a polite question, but uh, a challenging question. So I said, or I tried to say in science, we need to share the bad news or the good news. In your introduction, you mentioned four clinical trials. One of them has reported, it showed no efficacy on Purdue Pharma, which was supposed to develop the drug, decided not to pursue further. You also said that 1,600 forms of nanofares are commercially available. This is not true anymore, as the distributor has pulled the products because it does not work. And finally, I have a question. What is the percentage of nanoparticles that escape the endosome? I mean, this last question is the scientific question, and it's the critical one. And it's amazing that they could have published maybe 50 papers on this topic without ever uh, trying to quantify this essential parameter. And in many of the articles, without even discussing endocytosis whatsoever. And well, it did not let me <laughs> ask this question. It started shouting at me. The people, the audience in the room was kind of shell-shocked. And um, he called me a scientific terrorist and a scientific zealot. And um, there was a, a tiny bit of coverage afterwards. Um, and um, you know, one aspect of this story, which is even more serious, than, um, than this company. Uh, so, you know, part of the technology, as I've just explained, is, was about to detect mRNA. 
But then part of the technology was also about curing disease, as I've mentioned um, at the beginning. And uh, this was uh, rolled out with this company called Exicure. Uh, and this is the ID. Okay. So these particles, they will enter everywhere. Um, they will interact with oligonucleotides, with, with the, the, so they will interfere with genes and so on. Um, and um, they, th this company uh, ran a couple of clinical trials, and this is the value of the company. You can see that we are at the end, right? This company is dying. Uh, it will probably not survive 2023. But, you know, this, this was a huge number of millions of dollars which have been spent on this. And, um, and also, there were clinical trials. Um, and there were some more in preparation. And then something happened, which is that in November of last year, uh, there was basically a scientific fraud within the company that became uh, public. And that's interesting because, because the company was on the stock market, they had to, they have some rules on transparency that are much stricter than the rules we have in universities. Um, so in this case, the fact that it was uh, on the stock market meant that they had to release some information um, so that uh, stockholders would not be penalized by not having this information. Um, and yeah, in this case, uh, it's for Friedrich's ataxia, which is a relatively uh, rare disease. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, of course, this was also a, a case of hopes given to the, the, the people and the foundation uh, that, that support the patients in this field and so on. And then actually, basically, it was fraud. So, yes. Um, this is the company. This is the company. Or this is the, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but it says to develop drugs that impact disease located in tissue, um, conventional nucleic acids won't enter. So it's basically, so SNAs is for spherical nucleic acids. And actually, the history of this term would be also quite interested, interesting to discuss, but I can go over this in luck. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Maybe you end up in some kind of good circle, so then you stop him. And at, if at some point you say, oh, I'm, I was wrong to say so, because it, it, you cannot tell it, because you have to see the you, you see my point? Is that I see your point. I mean, I think there are, there are actually several things that you're saying here. But, and um, I, yeah, I'm not sure I completely agree. I mean, um, I think the, the the storytelling, you know, we, we, we always tell stories. And um, in that sense, science is not so different. Um, so if we simplify too much, um, then we are kind of lying. And then at some point, we cross a line that becomes basically scientific fraud. Um, so I think we have to be careful in the pursuit of telling nice stories. You know, at some point, it becomes not ethical and, and clearly, clearly wrong. But I'm not sure telling stories is necessarily exactly the, the, the big problem. Uh, surely, yes, science is messy. And this messiness, we have to reflect it in our papers. We can't simplify too much. We have to agree that, that we have to, sh to be transparent about the messiness of science. And I think this is, this is true. Um, 
but then yeah well, the, the the other point is um yeah the other the other point that you allude to is which i find very interesting is you know what happens once you have somewhere you know at the back of your mind that maybe there is something a bit wrong and but really you don't want to touch it because it would ruin your reputation or it would you know it would be problematic and i think this is very interesting and it's very very relevant to the topic of correction of science um you know, to what extent we are encouraged to recognize our errors and correct them. There is this idea that if you, exactly as you said, that, you know, if you do this, you, you're going to negatively affect your reputation, but it's not so obvious that it's true. Um, one area where this is tested is uh, retractions. So there is a lot of stigma around retractions. So you, generally speaking, people don't particularly want their papers to be retracted. Um, but actually, there are a few examples where people have retracted voluntarily their papers because they found that there was something wrong, that maybe they had done a big mistake in their interpretation. Sometimes they had to fight the editors to retract their own papers because the editors wouldn't want that to happen. Um, and generally, when that happens, when this kind of retraction happens, there is no cost to the person's career or reputation. And even it can be kind of admired they've done the brave thing they've actually looked critically at their work and you know this can be dependent on the field and so on i don't want to make it too general but i think we have to be open to the possibility that correcting even our own work is, is could be recognized as as something positive but it is uh, You're, you're absolutely right that the, the power relationship in this discussion are critical and, and yeah, something uh, that has to be, you, I mean, you couldn't correct on your own anyway, if you're like, you know, the student I mentioned earlier, he tried to do the right thing and it wasn't, it didn't pay very well for him. So, yeah, but yeah. So did science, co science self-correct? I mean, this is very much an ongoing story. I mean, the, the picture of uh, Exicure is, you know, it's still, uh, it's, but yeah, um, here I would say, you know, in the stripey story, I would say maybe if I wanted to put the number, I would say maybe 75% <laughs> it did correct, self-correct. Here, I think we are very far from that. Um, okay, so I want to, uh, I mean, I, I want to, uh, uh, to, to talk a little bit about some other people's work on uh, correction of science, because of course, uh, um, this is a uh, this is uh, something that a lot of different people are doing in different ways and so on. And uh, this is in no way uh, uh, a full picture. Uh, it's, I'm not trying to, but just to give you some other examples briefly. So just out of interest, uh, how many of you have heard of Elizabeth Bick? Nobody. Okay. And how many of you have heard of Gyo? Nobody. Yes. Maybe. Okay. Cool. So very briefly. Um, Elizabeth Bick is a bit of a star, really. <laughs> so um, she she became interested in uh, these stories of uh, errors. I mean, in, of fraud, really, um, in her case, uh, of fraud in science. And um, she made it her job to uh, literally a job to to detect these patterns, especially in biology papers, uh, of kind of doctored images, uh, uh, reused images, and so on. And um, and just to give you a, a little bit of a taste, uh, so she's used Twitter also to 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 to, to teach also people to um, to recognize uh, things. I mean, so can you spot the problem? I mean, this one is quite a difficult one, and um, I don't know if anyone see see something see something. There are clusters of cells which are repeated, which are which are repeated. And uh, if you spend a long time analyzing these pictures, you will eventually discover that all of these are repeated cells, the, the ones that are with different colors. It is crazy. I mean, why would you do this, actually? This is completely crazy because it's just a picture of cells. And this is a, something that comes back again and again, actually, in these stories about fraud, is that often you do wonder why, you know, why? <laughs> okay, it's a, it's because for some data they are hard to fake, but this kind 
is helping the plant. <laughs> We can we can imagine a lot of things like this. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe easier to go to the lab and take a picture of that. <laughs> uh, maybe you're more familiar with this story. This is uh, this is her again, but uh, this time challenging um, uh, a, a guy that you might have heard of, Didier Raoult. Um, so I mean the 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 big Didier Raoult uh, fraud case. Uh, she played a very critical role. She identified problems in hundreds of his papers. And um, you can, uh, and here she's, uh, she's saying, okay, this paper has been retracted, but there is no or withdrawn, but there is no explanation. What has happened? I mean, the editor should have some transparency explain to the readers and to us what, what has happened here. So of course she knows what happened because <laughs> she probably actually found the problems and, and uh, notified them. So what about Guillaume? So, He's a computer scientist, and uh, he was one of um, he was one of the Nature's Ten in last year in 2021, and um, he 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 has ways of uh, detecting problems in papers, and he has this page that you can check, which is called the Problematic Paper Screener, and I, this is actually I didn't update, so we're probably well over 12,000 now. Um, it's kind of detects automatically papers which have problems, which these problems are suggestive of scientific fraud. And then um, um, you will, I will give you uh, some examples in a minute. So here is a paper, for example, you might be interested, fabrication and applications of polymer graphene nanocomposites for sustainability. Sounds good. You can pay $22 to, to get it. And then when you read it, you will see this strange expression what do you think it means, adverse, adversely charged? Adversely charged. Sorry? Any idea? Doesn't mean anything. Decidedly charged. <laughs> Electrostatic oscillation. I mean, surface, surface, unpleasantness. You know, I mean, warm conductivity. <laughs> right. So what does it mean? Well, you're not far, yeah. So yeah, this is actually negatively charged, electrostatic attraction. So it's actually a very nice game. I mean, you can try to guess what these, what he calls tortured phrases are. They were in the paper, from the paper, okay? In the same one. All of these, I think, are from, uh, from this paper. Well, sometimes it is, but it can be from other countries too. Um, um, there is a good proportion that is from the Chinese paper, but then there is a good proportion of papers published which are Chinese. So, um, so the 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 way these are obtained is maybe not artificial intelligence, but it might be some kind of translation in a strange language and then translated again in English. And the aim is to basically so you basically take a paper that has been published, you modify the language using various tools so that it doesn't get detected anymore by a plagiarism detector. And then you get these kind of things and you publish it. And um, nobody cares because, I don't know, where is peer review happening? Where are the editors doing their jobs? You know, what we're talking about thousands and thousands of papers published um, by publishing companies that makes 30% profit margins and, you know, um, which are in this case Elsevier and but all the others as well have these problems. It's not that easy. No, it's not that easy, but in some cases we can, yes. No, because they, 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 they take, uh, what I mean is they take a paper where they're not authors and they modify it so that the plagiarism is not recognizable. And then they make papers out of kind of patchwork. And we actually can buy these papers as well. So. You can contact uh, what are, what is called a paper mill, uh, which, which is a company that will just produce papers, and um, yeah. So there is a whole industry. Yes. Yeah. So this is a good question. So, well, maybe they don't expect to be found out, um, and. Um, 
what I, what I can, well, I think in many cases they are authors and they publish because they, they did publish for their career. They just add the lines in the CV and then blah, blah, blah. So this is one option. And then there are also papers which are published for other reasons where the authors might not exist. Um, and those papers are published to increase number of citations of other papers. Because you can also buy citations, guys. Did you know that? <laughs> Everything is for sale. And actually, there, there is a, um, I think it's the Christmas period, so you might get 30% off until the first <laughs> OK. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip this. Um, the, yeah. I mean, I, I, you can read the gear misfortune caused by standard acids. <laughs> anyway, um, how many of you have heard of third seal? One, two, three, four, a little bit more than five, six. Okay, so maybe half of you. Well, I'm not going to get out of, uh, of my presentation, given the problems of screen sharing I've had before. <laughs> I don't want to restart this now. But uh, you should all uh, um, know about third and also use it. So it's pubpeer.com, and um, you might have heard of pubpeer, but not know or not use the pubpeer plugin that you need to have installed in your uh, web browser. And if you have this this plugin or this web extension, uh, then when you go on any article, um, if there are comments on pubpeer, this will be this will be shown. So you don't have to search on pubpeer; you just do your normal bibliographic work or whatever. And then when there is a paper you're interested in, or actually you're reading a paper and that paper cites some papers which have comments on top here, your web browser will tell you and you can just click and have a look what other people have said. Okay, so um, if I just conclude on this uh, uh, story, I mean, you know, 2000, the second attempt at, at course in science. So, you know, the first paper I've shown you was 2006, uh, commercialization in 2013. We published a paper in 2015. There was a, the Beretta, the Klonik and Beretta paper, 2017. Then, you know. so, but the point is that um, this is taking a very long time, and we can't really say that science has been correcting. But so, in parallel, what happens is that, you know, I realize. Um, that obviously the questions raised by those controversies are not are, are mostly not about science, by which I mean they're not scientific question, right? In the stripey story, the, the interesting question is not so much whether the stripes exist or not, but why did it take so long? You know, why what happens at MIT happened in this way, what and so on and so forth. So they are about how science works, not so much about the scientific questions. In the case of spherical nucleic acid, I think the the scientific questions are actually a bit more important, uh, but still, the, all the rest is very critical. So I started to discuss these questions about with colleagues uh, in the human sciences. In the human sciences, so Maya Noel is actually a chemist initially, and she re she um, retrained as a sociologist. And then we organized um, a meeting, uh, nanobubble scientific controversies in nanoscience, and eventually we we submitted in November. Um, 2019, uh, uh, an ERC synergy project, um, Nanobubbles. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this project, so which was funded and started about a year ago, which focuses on the mechanism of uh, correction of science. But before I do that, because there is a bit of news, as some of you have already maybe noticed. Um, um, so yesterday, there was an article in uh, Le Monde about a, a case, a, a scientific, scientific integrity case. And um, this is actually the university where I arrived uh, after Liverpool. So uh, Thierry was saying I spent 18 years in Liverpool and then two years ago, I was recruited as, as a professor at uh, Université Sorbonne Paris Nord and I joined the laboratory, uh, which was this laboratory, Nitemix CNRS at Sorbonne Paris Nord. And a few months after joining, I realized that uh, in the team I had joined, uh, there was a really big scientific uh, fraud case. And I had to report this. And then it took 
20 months, well, not now it's 20 months um, before, well, so this came out in the moon basically yesterday. Um, so it's quite a long story. I don't want to necessarily share all the details now, uh, but I'm quite happy to to, 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 to answer questions or to, to discuss it a little bit. I'm just going to give you a, a few of the elements of what, ha what happened. So yeah, so this I explained already. And so basically I, I discovered this by accident. And as I was, you know, as we, we were discussing earlier with the cell work, I mean, you just wonder why anyone would do something like this because it's, this is part of this story is about histograms, as you can see here. These three histograms are exactly identical. The only difference is that the X axis is changing. And for any of you who has worked with nanoparticles, I mean, there is just no way that you you measure the size distribution. Sorry? <laughs> <You've got> a, <laughs> exactly, you the curve. It's a change. There's just no way that this could happen, right? Also, if you if you look at the polydispersity, I mean, it's funny, right? I mean, this, you look at this, it's, a, it's not such a great material, but if you look at the distribution, they are all 29 nanometer, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I, so I, I saw this and then basically I, I, um, I looked at other papers and I discovered that this same histogram had been reused in many other papers as well. Um, and and then, then you discover other things. Sorry? Yes, it's a different scale. Yeah, it's a different scale. And, and it's, it's crazy because in, in some of the other papers, you can actually see that like the zero is kind of cropped a little bit because they use a, a white square to, to hide the numbers and put some new numbers. <laughs> so it's really, so yeah, yeah. So this is the overview of the case. So the, the green ones are papers which in my view don't require any correction because um, okay, let me finish and I'll come back to this in a second. So the, the green ones, yeah, they don't require correction because they are kind of paper, they are I think the first time these data have been used and then they, those data are reused in other papers. So uh, so this is now 20 months after I reported this case. And there is one paper which has been retracted, um, the 2019 here. There are nine papers which have been corrected and many papers which where nothing has happened, right? And uh, um, what, what happened is that the, the reason you have so many corrections is that um, the sort of scientific part of the case. Um, so when, when you, if any of you uh, one day has to report a case of uh, misconduct or suspicion of, of, uh, of misconduct, um, you have to know that the, the integrity procedure is, so in each institution, it's now mandatory since uh, December 2029, uh, 2021, sorry. Um, in each institution, you have a referent integrity. So an integrity officer, there is one at this university. There is one for CNRS, maybe it's in the room, I don't know. <laughs> um, and they, they are in charge of doing these investigations. Um, but they don't decide on sanctions. Their job is to establish the facts, write a report. Um, and then this report is going to be uh, the basis and, and for recommendations for the correction of science and maybe some other action that might be taken. And then if, if there is a need for this clear procedure, then that's a different, uh, different procedure um, that, will, that will happen. So in this case, after the report was completed with the help of two experts, I haven't seen the report. There is no transparency there. Um, the recommendation was correction. So the, the text said, sent to the laboratory literally says, you know, you should correct these all of these papers, which is crazy because then it means what the author do is they, and they're instructed to do so by their institution, 
is they contact each individual editor and they say, ah, sorry, we did a mistake with this figure. And they give another figure to replace that figure. But of course, this is a lie. I mean, by omission in any case, because they don't give the background, they, they, you know, it's not a mistake. I mean, or at least it's not just a genuine mistake. This, this, they are doing this because there has been an integrity case. Um, and the problem is not just about that paper, it's about 20 papers. So, so you have these corrections and then these corrections themselves have, have other problems. Anyway, I've tried to keep it short on this story and I'm happy to, to, to take some further questions with respect to further. And then you can also read the article in Le Monde and tell me what you think of it. I would be very interested. Um, one editor though, received the request for a correction from the author and thought, well, no, you know, I can't take this as a correction. And, uh, and so that editor imposed a retraction. So this is a retraction against the wishes of the authors. And it's spelled out in the retraction there. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, yeah, I can have the last couple of minutes. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to say a few words about this uh, project. So it started about a year ago and um, it focused on this question of how, when, and why does science fail to correct itself. And we're focusing on three, and you, as I, I was saying, it's a very broad interdisciplinary collaboration between human sciences and uh, uh, computer sciences and nanosciences, let's say. Um, and we focus on three kind of nano themes, uh, uh, nanoparticles cross the blood brain barrier, or do they? the protein corona that changes everything and this issue of entry of nanoparticles in the cell. And so far we've mostly concentrated on, on that issue. And um, um, yeah, I'm not gonna really talk about the other two. Um, we're trying to understand um, how errors or contested claims kind of circulate. We're making some attempts at correcting the scientific record. So one of those is to use PubPeer as a kind of everyday tool. So we basically read and critically analyze and share on PubPeer um, analysis of those papers related to one of these themes. And the aim is to um, you know, help understand what is solid, what is not solid, and also hopefully um, generate interest in people using these tools as an everyday part of the life of a normal life of a scientist. Um, and you know, NNC trust, how do we, we how do we increase trust in science? How do we also make that trust, um, you know, how do we earn that trust in a way as well? So I'll, I'll skip I'll skip this. Um, maybe um, maybe I'll skip, well I'll go very quickly uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of expertise that is present in the in the project, so there are colleagues from science and technology studies who would look at tacit knowledge, because you know one of the things naively I thought at the beginning was also that the correcting science means publishing a correction or a refraction. But actually, knowledge is much more than what is in the papers. It's also what you know the discussions we have we have at coffee at conferences and the the knowledge that we have in the labs of how we do things, and not everything is always in in the. Yeah. In the in the papers and it's interesting to to study this. So um, yeah, I'll probably have time to do this. So I'll just uh, and and I've mentioned sorry I've mentioned oops I've mentioned a little bit digital methods so used by our colleagues computer scientists and this can be used to automatically detect problematic papers but it could also be used and this is something we're looking at to kind of track how ideas circulate you know between papers and I think I don't know how you feel, but um, there are so many papers published and also so many bad papers published that it becomes very difficult, especially for the young people who start in the field to really find their way in this jungle. And these tools can be quite useful to, to analyze papers at large scale as well, and to study kind of networks of citations and so on. How do some claims become amplified and others maybe not so much? Yeah. Yeah, this is a really, really good question. This is a really good question. It's a question we are 
a question we are struggling with uh, all the time, or these colleagues are struggling with all the time. There's a Russian side for everything. Yes, there is a Russian side for everything, but the Russian side, the side that you that you allude to, um, is not appropriate for uh, the, uh, well for for automatically looking at very large number of papers, and also you couldn't do this and then publish it. Like if if your if your research methods means querying SciHub on a um, mega scale, you would get in big trouble for sure. Um, definitely, like you, you have a lawsuit coming your way. If you use it privately, that's no problem. I mean, nobody's yeah. going to, well, maybe it is, but nobody's going to bother. But if you try to publish a paper where you explicitly say, I have used SciHub to do large scale analysis of uh, 10,000 of scientific articles, I can, I can guarantee you that you will have a lawsuit coming your way from uh, the big publishers. This, there, there is no, and they have the money. So you will suffer. Um, so um, um, yeah. So I conclude. I don't know if I answered your your question. Did I? Yeah. How do we get the yeah. How do we? Yeah, I didn't answer the. <laughs> thank you for reminding me. I didn't. So so the answer is a little bit. Um, well, so basically there are two there are two ways. Um, first of all, a lot of these analyses are only done on uh, titles and abstracts. So this you can get for free. Um, and we have you know, real experts uh, in the team on, on the computer sciences, but also we have a, a bibliometrician uh, who is uh, very extraordinary. So, <laughs> so we, we have a lot of experts to do these kind of things and we, we can do it at scale. Also the citations are also uh, free, freely accessible. So you can look at uh, networks of citations between papers and all of this is no problem. Then when you want to go into the full text, that's where the problem happens. And here, um, basically we do this on a smaller scale. So if we want a thousand papers, well, we might get an agreement with some publishers to download a, a few hundred papers or maybe even a few thousand papers. So then we have to kind of negotiate and, and to do things, or do things manually, with, which is kind of doable for relatively small number of papers, but not for 100,000 papers. Yeah, I mean, the, we there, they, they, there are some mutual interests and there are also some clear blocking points. So like uh, Guillaume, I, I mentioned, yeah, he has some discussions with, uh, you know, with publishers and, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yes, it's very uh, complicated. They, they, they are, and I mean, actually, I was, I was in discussions in 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 a in a meeting organized by Nature Publishing Group last week, where they were kind of exploring various things, and you know, I mean, these various publishers, they are thinking about their model and their about trust and about how integrity might affect them and so on. But there are also forces, you know, so on one hand, you could think integrity should be something so important for them. On the other hand, you look at how much they invest in integrity, you know, how big is their integrity team? And, um, you know, how many people are employed by uh, Elsevier to do some hard work of looking at claims, doing some investigations and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, so you, you can balance these things. And, you know, on the other hand, you have huge, you know, they make huge profits out of large scale publishing of crap. So it's, it's quite complicated. Yeah, I think they can't, they, they, when you retract, you make no profit, that is true. Okay, I, I think this is the next one is my last slide. I just want to mention um, that in this project, as you can imagine, there are some quite thorny ethical questions. Um, like I've mentioned just a few minutes ago, the, the case in my own university. And uh, I mean, these, these stories are always very painful. Um, 
for the people involved, for the whistleblowers, for the institutions. Um, it's always highly toxic, highly complicated. There are, there are the case of the PhD students. There are, there are the kind of people directly involved in the story. And then there are also people that you might not see who might be working on a similar topic in another laboratory and so on. There is there are some moral imperatives in my view to correct science, but there are also you know it's not victimless, and uh, so we spend a lot of time thinking about all of this and trying to to make the best decisions, but it's um, it's not uh, it is not always very easy. This this is actually the, the kind of network of scientists involved in the project, and um, this is the kind of thank you slides from the VRC project. And with that, I would like to thank you and to continue the discussion. Thank you very much.